Pamela Pereski is a senior fellow at the Network Contagion Research Institute and previously an SNF visiting fellow at Johns Hopkins University's Agora Institute. Her project, Habits of a Free Mind, Psychology for Democracy and the Good Life, aims to develop a set of teachable habits necessary for engaging along lines of difference without feeling traumatized and without dehumanizing others. She is also the creator of A Year of Kindness, a research-based guided journal that encourages people to record daily acts of kindness and thoughts of gratitude. Dr. Pereski formerly was of the University of Chicago's Institute on the Formation of Knowledge and Director of Aspen Center for Human Development. I will point out that perhaps something that has been very special to her and further galvanizing her work is that she was the leading researcher at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression at the time that Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt wrote their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, which continues to resonate with readers today. She has written extensively for Psychology Today, the New York Times, and other prestigious outlets. She received a BA in anthropology from Columbia University, an MA in clinical psychology from Pepperdine University, and an interdisciplinary PhD in human development and psychology from the University of Chicago. I went to the um, uh, launch of the University of Chicago's new forum for free inquiry and expression, um, which was on October um, 5th and 6th. And um, on, on one panel, David French spoke about arguments for censoring. Um, you know, when we want to censor disfavored speech, there are different reasons we want to do it. And one reason is that it might lead people to believe things that are false or things that are bad for them uh, or bad for society or that people might become violent if persuaded by a certain speech. So these are arguments for censorship that we can discuss because the claim uh, that, that um, as, as far as people who want to you know, defend the censorship, is um, that there's something that will happen as a result of the speech. And so we can ha talk about the speech itself. But there's a different kind of claim about the harms of speech that as far as its defenders are concerned is not open to disagreement I mean, because that is the argument that speech itself denies or invalidates or erases people's identities um, or is even a type of violence in and of itself. Um, so talking about it, debating it, would be the harm, right? Um, so according to this logic, not only should it be prohibited, but anyone using those prohibited words or expressing prohibited ideas should be canceled. Right? And if that doesn't work, violence is acceptable. Um, that's the speech is violence argument. Right? Um, we saw that in, in September of 2017 when um, uh, in February of, of 2017, when Milo Yiannopoulos' scheduled talk at Berkeley was canceled uh, because of a violent mob. Um, and the students that engaged in it justified their violent response as self-defense. You can read their justifications in the Berkeley paper where they said that it was a legitimate exercise of self-defense. Um, then we saw this argument again in September of 2017 when Ben Shapiro was scheduled to give a talk at Berkeley. And students were offered counseling services. Uh, the message to the students from the administration read in part, we are deeply concerned about the impact some speakers may have on individuals' sense of safety and belonging. No one should be made to feel threatened or harassed simply because of who they are or for what they believe. And that was in response to Ben Shapiro coming to speak on campus, not in response to what we're seeing now. And many activities, they said, many activities are being planned by academic administrative units to affirm Berkeley's commitment to a deep understanding of how these challenging times impact our campus's diverse communities and climate. In response to Ben Shapiro speaking at the University of Chicago, not in response to chants of globalize the intifada. 
So anyway, this group is, is, uh, is familiar with many examples of campus illiberalism. Uh, and so I'm, I'm only going to mention a few just to put things in um, sort of uh, stark relief. Um, we saw uh, a widely mocked safe space created in response to a debate about rape culture. Uh, we saw a mob that came after Brett Weinstein for objecting to the call for all white people to not come to campus on a given day. Um, we saw a professor investigated for having a conversation with her class about the movie title, I Am Not Your Negro, and the book version title, which didn't use the word Negro, because she mentioned the word in having the conversation about the different titles. Um, off campus, we saw the forced resignation of an accomplished New York Times science writer for mentioning the N-word and asking for details about how it was used. Uh, we saw the New York Times staff launch a social media campaign claiming that running a Tom Cotton op-ed about using the military to deal with the riots and looting of 2020 puts black New York Times staff in danger. That was the, the publication of the article, not if the uh, speech was persuasive, but the publication of the article itself puts the New York Times staff in danger. That resulted in the forced resignation of the New York Times opinion editor and others. So that's the background. Uh, and then on October 6th, uh, when I returned to New York, where I, I now live, I got home, I got my plane landed about 11.30 at night, and my iPhone started buzzing, and it didn't stop buzzing for hours, because the app I had downloaded when I was in Israel earlier this year was sending me rocket alerts in rapid succession. Um, 11.30 at night Eastern was 6.30 in the morning on Shabbat, October 7th, and the demonic brutality was beginning at that moment. It took one day to see vigils and demonstrations in support of an attempted genocide and the most depraved acts of terrorism perpetrated on Jews since the Holocaust complete with signs reading glory to the martyrs, if you haven't seen this. Um, it took one day. So how did we get here? I would say that until relatively recently, the vast majority of Americans understood liberty and justice as universal moral goods. And we understood them in a certain way. There was a taken-for-granted acceptance of the imperative to stand firm for non-negotiable demands for human dignity. Among those demands, freedom of speech, the rule of law, and equality under the, under the law, tolerance, respect for women and minorities, the right to private property, the importance of objectivity, and the limits of the power of the state. But there's a problem with taking any central moral claim for granted. And, and that is that while we might assume that our enemies don't share a moral code, the assumption of the centrality or at least the acceptance of the same moral claims by one's allies often goes unchallenged. Um, and that is the challenge that we're seeing now. There's, there's also the risk that those um, moral uh, imperatives or absolutes or universals that we uh, that we think our allies and our um, uh, fellow citizens subscribe to, um, there's a risk that if we don't continue to talk about them, if we don't continue to teach them, that they fade into the background or they fade into oblivion. Um, and when the North Star that guides our behavior interpretations is forgotten, then some other constellation can take its place. Um, so now, uh, we get to this point where, um, however wrong-headed most Jews and others who stood in solidarity with groups like Black Lives Matter and Students for Justice in Palestine, um, which is the most effective promoter of the boycott, div divestment, and sanctions movement, they likely did so in the spirit of defending at least many of those moral non-negotiables, thinking that those were shared. And those who failed to vocally object to the tenets of those groups either 
remained silent out of a mistaken assumption that those moral imperatives were shared by all, or by a fear that saying the wrong thing would, revert, would, would result in them being you know, excoriated, canceled, et cetera. So what's become clear, at least to some of them now, is that the people who lead these groups, at least, and an unknown proportion of their members do not, in fact, share those moral, uh, those elements of our moral compass. Um, and, and what has happened instead is um, the replacement of an enlightenment paradigm with a paradigm in which the locus of virtue is not the individual, but the perceived powerlessness of groups. The paradigm is infused with narratives of appropriation, privilege, greed, and hidden power. These are thinly veiled anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. But whiteness rather than Jewishness is the villain and the locus of power, and most Jews are then made white. And then the morality of an action, especially on campus, this, this paradigm says, or the people on campus are, are especially um, likely to subscribe to this moral paradigm, that the morality of an action is now a function of the relative perceived power of the actor's group identity and the relationship between the actor and the person being acted on. Um, in this new paradigm, that means it's only the number of casualties that matters because that's what indicates relative power. Um, this is a paradigm that divorces intention from impact. I'm sure you've seen on Canvas, it's impact, not intent, that matters. And you can see now what the direct um, thread is to being able to, um, to say that uh, it doesn't matter that one faction intends for civilians to be killed and the other intends to spare civilians' lives because intention doesn't matter, only impact. So the numbers of casualties is all that matters. It leads to the moral inversion of claiming that when Hamas refuses to allow Palestinian civilians to seek shelter or to evacuate, when the IDF warns of future bombing campaigns, it's Israel, not Hamas, that's guilty of war crimes. And it leads to defending the most barbaric war crimes horrors intentionally inflicted on Jews and other Israelis while holding Israel responsible, not just for its campaign of bombing, but for those war crimes committed by Hamas. So I'll just close by saying that, that today, the people who once believed that the BDS movement and various other ancillary uh, movements represented a legitimate critique of Israel's policies um, and that the Black Lives Matter movement was a movement that truly cared about justice and fairness as those things are conceived in a pluralist liberal democracy, are faced with a moral reckoning as they watch these movements explicitly call the massacre, rape, torture, and kidnapping of civilians as I'm going to use the words they use, reasonable, justified, and heroic, okay? People are even tearing down posters of kidnapped hostages. This is unvarnished anti-Semitism, and, you know, and it's anti-civilization. Um, it's inhumane, and it's being dismissed as political speech. From the river to the sea is a call for the ethnic cleansing of Jews at best and a complete gen genocide at worst. Globalize the intifada is less ambiguous. And the chant, there's only one solution, is, is pretty chilling. Uh, this is an era in which students have learned that saying America is a melting pot, is a microaggression. A debate about rape culture requires a safe space. And the phrase, all lives matter, is offensive. It's so offensive that people just don't say it anymore. But calling for the genocide of Jews and celebrating the terrorists who raped children to the point of breaking their pelvises, slaughtered families in their beds, shot children in the face, and tortured them until they begged to be killed, and kidnapped over 200 people of all ages is the moral thing to do. Celebrating that is the moral thing to do on campus. So let's be crystal clear about it. The genocide of Jews 
was always a political thing. It was the aim of a political program. Even the term anti-Semitism was a political program. And now in response to Jewish students expressing their legitimate fear for their safety, as members of their own campuses, their own peers, aided and abetted by professors and administrators, openly declare their support for terrorism that targets Jews, these same institutions that created the safe spaces and trained them in microaggressions and have been offering trigger warnings suddenly and miraculously become staunch defenders of freedom of speech, which I support. I support this pivot, but the timing is really something. Our democracy is profoundly unwell, and we see this most on college campuses. And all I can say at this moment is at least the masks are off. And it's up to us in this room what happens next. <laughs>